Hey, well, good evening. Um, my name is Matt. If we haven't met before, I'm one of the leaders at this church, and it is my pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Um, last Sunday, we started a brand new teaching series called Outsiders. And the idea is that in a world and in a society where often group peoples of people are marginalized and excluded, Jesus showed us what it truly means to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so through his interactions with Gentiles, with the poor, with women, with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, and so on, Jesus turned societal norms on their head. And so in this series, what we're looking to do is to explore the stories of those who Jesus included, much to the shock and dismay of those who already considered themselves to be in. Why are we doing this? Well, because as disciples of Jesus, we need to know how Jesus lives so we can follow in his footsteps and allow for his message and his transforming spirit to do a work in us so that we can go forth and do the same and create spaces where people who may be considered outsiders can become insiders, fully welcomed, fully loved, fully honored as they are. And so last week, Peter teed us off brilliantly uh, with the talk on Jesus and the LGBT community. And this week, I'm going to be speaking about Jesus and women. So over the last few weeks, I've mentioned to a few people that this is what I'm going to be speaking about. And uh, not every time, but quite a few times, people said, but you're a man, Um, which is well spotted. And actually, you know, it is, um, that's a fair response, I think, because let's be honest, there's an awful lot that I will never really know or comprehend about what it means um, to be a woman. So it's fair to say that I am underqualified to speak about women. I am, however, not underqualified to speak about theology and the Bible. And I think that there is something to be said and something powerful at that, to have a man, particularly a man in my particular position, who will stand here and affirm and advocate and promote the position of women from the Bible, just as it would be for a woman to say the same for a man. So I, um, I grew up um, in a home where both my parents worked full time, both took responsibility for the cleaning, both took responsibility for the cooking. I didn't grow up thinking that my dad was the head of the family, but my parents were a co-equal unit. My primary and my secondary schools both had female head teachers. I grew up in a middle-of-the-road Anglican church, robed choir, stuff like that, which always had female clergy from the time that I was born. Not as senior positions, but always there and respected and regarded as um, godly people. It came as a bit of a surprise when I moved to London and went to university and discovered that there's a whole host of people who feel it's really important to emphasize complementary but divergent, uh, you know, roles for men and women, both in the church and in the household. Now, I say that not so that you would think that I've, you know, managed to avoid all blind spots or biases. That is, of course, not the case. But I think it's helpful that you know my starting point when it comes to this particular talk. Now, some of you may share that sort of similar experience. Um, say, say you didn't grow up in a Christian home. You could have had, like, an, uh, you know, an experience a bit like mine. You could have also had a far more patriarchal um, structure in your family life. For those of you who grew up in the church, um, you may have been in churches or encountered churches where it is taught from the front and from the Bible that women are not permitted to speak. That is to say, teach the Bible except if they're teaching other women or children. Or you may have come from churches that never explicitly say anything about the roles of men or women, but if you thought hard about it, you'd realize there weren't really very many women at the front of my church. And alternatively, you may have been churches where it couldn't have been more clear when overt from the front. Of course, we affirm all women in all places in the church. They should lead and they should teach. But then for some really unexplained reason, again, you never really saw that happen from the front. And it's important to acknowledge these sorts of dynamics of where we come from. So even though I um, grew up in a church uh, that included female clergy, um, when I discerned my sense of vocation to do what I'm doing um, right now, there were men who I could look up to. They might not be just like me, but I go, well, you're a little bit like me, and I can see how this could be part of the trajectory of my life. This has not been the case for all women. And I know many uh, women leaders who have been in churches that affirm women as leaders. However, when it actually came to positions of leadership, they were overlooked in favor of young men. And for those women who actually did manage to smash through the glass ceiling, many many will have felt that they have actually been treated differently from their male counterparts. Perhaps when they got angry about something, 
They were treated in a different way. They weren't um, held well in that moment. Perhaps they were socialized into ask, not asking for opportunities and advancement that would come quite easily to other men. I'm also conscious that away from the, the politics of church sort of hierarchy, for want of a better word, that for many single women in our church, um, that misogyny is alive and well on our dating apps. Uh, many so-called eligible men are terrified by strong, confident women and have no problem using the chat feature to mansplain at length about their key texts and their vision of headship and church leadership and how you know, they're really looking for their Proverbs 31 woman. We will all have a variety of experiences within our church, and it's important that we acknowledge it. And it's important to say these things from the front because I may have said things there that have never occurred to you before, and there'll be others of you here who'll be thinking, yes, finally it's being said. And of course, what I've said is actually just the church. How about we zoom out, look at the macro for a little bit. Um, so the Global Gender Gap Report for 2022 from the World Economic Forum claimed that on average, women worldwide earn 63% of what men earn, 27% of managerial positions, and 23 of parliamentary seats are held by women. Women shoulder a disproportionate burden of unpaid care work, including childcare, elderly care, household chores. And all of this is before we begin to look at violence against women, maternal mortality, and educational attainments. And of course, there'll be different numbers and things all across the world in different parts of the places. There are asterisks and footnotes and reasons why there are complexities to these results. But the report ends by saying that at the current rate of progress, it will take 132 years to reach full parity. This is where we're at. This is the world that we live in right now. And therefore, there are reasons why women may feel a righteous anger about their experience because it's unfair and it's devaluing, it's unkind. Many women have felt belittled even and experienced self-doubt even when they know themselves to be leaders. Many women struggle to envisage their own leadership because there have been so few, role, so few role models to look up to. And many women will know the sadness, the sadness and the frustration that comes with being overlooked for opportunities that are often enjoyed by less qualified men. There is work to be done in our church and in our world. What a tragedy it is and what a loss for God's kingdom that most of our communities are disempowered, silenced and set to the side. We must talk about these things. We must speak about these things so that for some of us, our consciousness is brought about and we actually realize how things are. And for others of us, we can acknowledge our reality. Because this is a starting point. Because what we need to do is we need to invite God, all of us, into the very center of our lives to open our hearts to him and allow for him to bring his transforming spirit into us, into our church, into our world. So that we can begin the work with God, the renewing of all creation, as we've sung about tonight. And you'll probably um, be fully aware that Jesus lived in a world that was a little bit like this as well. In some ways, we haven't come that much further forward. Women in his society were often despised. And yet, and yet, Jesus treated them in an altogether honoring way. I want to give you just a little bit of a flavor of the world that Jesus um, came to. So the first century historian Josephus said this, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and the temerity of their sex. Levity means silliness, and temerity means cheek. He's basically saying, silly, giggly, cheeky little girls, they can't be trusted with anything, don't let them into your courts. Jewish, good Jewish Orthodox boys would pray from the Talmud each day, saying, blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has made me not a woman, or a Gentile, or a slave. Are you starting to get the idea of the world that Jesus was born into and ministered into? How women were thought of in the first century. This is a patriarchal society. And as you know, patriarchy is the idea that a certain society revolves around men and their leadership, they're the decision makers, and women play a supporting role. And in the Bible, we see this. Israel had kings. Israel had male priests, and then we get to the New Testament, and Jesus had male disciples. The lives of men dominate the pages of the scriptures. Everybody agrees on that. However, what is 
is not always what should be. Just because something happens in Scripture does not mean that's the way it ought to be. For example, Solomon with 700 concubines. <laughs> Slavery. It's not right. It's not meant to be. Okay, so this is my understanding of Scripture and God's action in the world. So, okay, God does not reveal his full will all at once, but allows it to unfold over time. He progressively reveals it. Also, God uses or accommodates already existing systems to communicate his revelation in culturally familiar ways for people. So, and, you know, basically, because he's got a long-term plan that he's working towards his complete redemption. Let me give you a really obvious example beyond the two that I've just mentioned. Old Testament sacrifice. Okay, so the sacrificial practices that we read about in the Torah at the start the Bible, um, symbolizing atonement for sins. A shift happens in the New Testament when Jesus arrives because Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins as we've just seen here as we took communion. Hebrews chapter 10 explains that the sacrificial system of the Old Testament with its repeated bloody animal sacrifices served as a temporary provision until the coming of Christ. And so over a long period of time, centuries and centuries, God has progressively revealed his purposes, accommodating the Israelites' practices and worship, and he's guided humanity humanity towards a deeper understanding of sacrifice through Jesus. I think this matters when we look at patriarchy in the Bible too. Yes, of course it's part of antiquity. Of course it is now as well. We've got male priests, male kings, male disciples, but we should be looking for the pointers, the nods, and the nudges that say that this is not how it's meant to be in scriptures. And so even in a patriarchal society like the one I've just described, we should see hints and we should expect to see a time when sons and daughters shall prophesy. We should catch glimpses of men and women together in leadership. And when women are considered too giggly and silly to provide testimony and too dishonorable that they're categorized with slaves and Gentiles, we should expect for them to be given the special honor of being the first witnesses and the first to proclaim our Lord's resurrection from the dead. And so the patriarchy, it's alive. It's alive and well in the pages of Scripture. It's alive and well in the history of the church. It's alive and well today as well. But there are more than a few hints that say this is not how it's meant to be. And so what I want to do is I want to use our remaining time together to unpick some of what I consider to be misreadings of Scripture that have caused inequality and prejudice within the church, propagated the idea that the genders are not or should not be equal. And so when Kevin on salt messages to you again, you've got some answers to give. So, might be sharing my age here. Do any of you Gen Zs know the comedy panel show QI? Hosted by Sandy Toxvig? Yeah? Some of you are looking blankly at me right now. I hate you. Um, how are the millennials doing? We're good. Okay. QI, it's on BBC. The panelists, there's a series of questions on topics uh, that really sort of challenge common assumptions. If you get the answer right, you say something interesting, you say something funny, you score points. What happens if a panelist gives an answer that is considered too obvious to the host or is wrong? Klaxon. The klaxon goes off. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce you to my patriarchy klaxon. There we go. That can be louder. So, this thing, this thing goes off when it hears patriarchal nonsense communicated as a biblical fact. It's also got a bottle opener for your Bacardi breezes as well. So it's very, very good. I'll move that here. Should we give this thing a go? Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That means Max. In the beginning, man was created before women, which signifies the natural hierarchy or order of authority. Okay. Right, let's go. The Bible begins with an incredible act of God uh, who fashions good and a beautiful world. Light, day and night, waters, sky, all manners of creatures and birds, and they are designed and commanded to produce in abundance. So chapter 1, verse 26 in our old Bible says, Let us make man in our image and likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea, the birds and the sky, livestock, wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. Man. Man is an old and poor translation. The word is Adam. 
hence the name. And Adam does not mean man, it does not mean male, it means human. Which is why, if you've got a more modern translation, the NIV UK, the more recent one, they broadly agree that it should say mankind, not man or humankind, even better. How do we know that this is a poor translation? Well, firstly, it switches from Adam singular to they plural straight away, implying that Adam stands for human, male and female together. But it becomes even more clear when you get to verse 27. They are created in God's own image, which means they are like him in special ways and are not that is not true of other creatures. Presumably, this relates to their unique ability to rule over creation. If the only thing we had in our Bibles was Genesis chapter 1, we would have to assume that men and women were co-equal, co-rulers of the earth and made in the image of God. Okay? Now, as we know, there's a second creation story that comes straight after the first in the next chapter. So the second account, it goes back, it retells some of the story in a slightly different way, and we're given a bit more detail about how man was formed. So chapter 2, it says, He, the man, was made from the dust, from the earth. Man is given a job. He works in the garden, and he's warned not to eat from a special tree. God then forms animals to be his helper, to presumably to tend to the garden and rule the earth, but they were considered to not be helpful or not be suitable uh, as helpers. Now, I do not want us to get bogged down in this word helper. This word "isa" helper, it does not mean assistant. It does not mean secretary, but neither does it also mean savior. Helper is a very good neutral word for someone who helps someone else. If my car breaks down and I need to move it to the side of the road, I need help. I need someone who's going to share in the work with me. If man is tasked with extending the goodness of creation into the chaos beyond the borders of the garden, man needs help. When Genesis says that woman was made from man's rib, that does not mean that she's derivative, but simply means that she's like him. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It's not that she's less of him. It means that she's human just like him. He's not superior in any way because he was made first. The logic of saying what made first is more superior makes no sense because humanity was made last in the order of creation, making us worse than ants. Make it make sense. Nothing from Genesis chapter 2 clearly establishes headship, female submission, or unique male leadership. In fact, quite the opposite. Man is is not commanded to lead or guide women. Instead, he's united to her, and they become one. At the fall, the curse on the woman was that the man would rule over her. No! The fall, or as I prefer to call the undoing, the undoing of the good work in creation, all the beauty and innocence and harmony and unity, it's undone. You know the story. Trouble comes out of nowhere. The serpent sows seeds of doubt into the woman's mind. She gives in to temptation. Adam's not on the sideline. He's not absent. He's there. He joins in the rebellion. And when they're confronted, they begin to pass the blame between one another. Man blames woman. Woman blames serpent. And all of this backstabbing and division unravel God's work in establishing unity and abundance. The consequence, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, I don't think any of us need to be proper theologians to realize that's not a good thing. This is so obviously not a good thing. Ruling was not the plan. It's not the blessing. So the verb here is absolute authority over someone, like a king ruling over a subject. The creation accounts do not call for man to rule over women. They are meant to co-rule over creation together. Slightly more difficult interpretive issue comes with the bit about desiring will be towards her husband. Um, So the ESV translates this as your desire shall be contrary to the husband. That's largely regarded as not very good. I think a better phrase which I've come across is that your desire will be to undermine your husband. And so does Genesis chapter 3 say that men must lead and women must follow? No, it doesn't. But it does go in some way to sort of really give a picture, an explanation for the mess that we found ourselves in. The undoing of God's good creation results in man and woman not helping one another in the co-ruling of creation, but looking to undermine and looking to subdue one another. This is not an ideal to be aspired to. It's one that we ought to reject in a heavy way. The pattern of male leadership is established in the Old Testament and continues to this day. 
No! Some argue that the pattern of male leadership established in the Old Testament, such as Abraham, Moses, the 12 patriarchs, the male kings, David, Solomon, the prophets, extended to the 12 apostles in the New Testament, applies to the church today. Once again, just because something has happened in Scripture does not mean that's how it ought to be. But also, there are a few female leaders in the Old Testament as well, predominantly Deborah, the judge. So even if that is exceptional as opposed to normative, how on earth can we possibly argue that only men can be leaders when God has permitted women to be leaders. Make it make sense. Okay, but Jesus only had male disciples among the 12, so this must be the example. Are you enjoying this? Yeah. No! Jesus had an array of disciples, and yet 12 among them are named in the four Gospels. Why these 12? Well, one reason made explicit in the text is that Christ is creating a conscious parallel to the 12 tribes of Israel, sort of named after Jacob's sons. He's trying to show where his authority, where his background is coming from. There may be other cultural reasons. Jewish um, rabbis tended to have disciples of the same sex. It was typical, um, of course, for rabbis to have quite a large following of disciples, depending on how influential influential they are, and Jesus was pretty influential, and then have a core or several cores of groups who he would give particular teaching to, and they would sort of know his teaching more intimately. So perhaps, actually, there's lots of disciples running around, but then these 12 are sort of called out because Jesus is trying to make these links with the Old Testament because he's calling his people back to himself. And so, yeah, they're forerunners. They go out, they're sent out in pairs, but then so do the, 70, so do the 72 shortly after. Now, we don't know whether women were included in the 72, but they might have been. Now, John's gospel um, plays this out even more um, clearly, I think. So the, the 12 are only mentioned twice, once in verse, uh, chapter 6 and once in chapter 20. And what seems to be clear in John's gospel is that Jesus has got lots of circles, a plurality of circles of people who he is working with, some of which are male, some of which are mixed gender. So we've got um, Bethany, uh, the, the girls from Bethany, Mary, Martha, but also their brother. And another is Mary Magdalene and her woman of myrrh-bearing, um, the, the myrrh-bearing woman. Now, I think John's gospel is quite uh, interesting. I think this is done on purpose, like because when he's writing his gospel, John is writing from a different place. And so he's writing from Ephesus, which is sort of at the far end of the Roman Empire. It's Gentile. So John speaks about um, Jewish festivals like Passover quite a lot, probably because there's a Jewish community that he wants to connect to. But then also there's probably a load of cosmopolitan women going around um, Ephesus as well who've been converted as well. And so when John's framing his gospel, there's all sorts of women who are brought into the mix and seem to be disciples of Jesus. We see Jesus' mother mentioned, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the woman anointed despite Judas objecting, the woman at the cross. And it's the male disciples, of course, that deserted Jesus. And so John's gospel provides quite a stable foundation for the inclusion of female disciples in Jesus' inner circle. And with that, I want to take particular mention of Mary Magdalene. Now, Contrary to uh, popular assumptions, she was not a prostitute. She was not a uh, a woman of ill repute. According to Luke, um, she was someone Jesus cured from oppression of seven demons. Now, presumably, she is one of the women who traveled around with um, Jesus and financially supported him and his ministry out of her own funds. Now, she is mentioned by name in all four Gospels. She's in the uh, the Passion narratives. And so she is remembered for all time as a uniquely and loyal and faith-filled disciple. Matthew tells us that Mary Mags and the other Mary, imagine being the the other Mary for all of time, they go to the tomb after the resurrection. They're greeted by an angel who announces to them the resurrection of Jesus, and then they are filled with faith, and they leave with joy, ready to tell the disciples. Luke's gospel back there tells us that while the women were faithful to the task, the male disciples doubted. And so, You know, we can fixate on the leadership of the church as the male 12 or 11 disciples or apostles, but we know these men had their flaws. Peter denied, Thomas doubted, John bragged about being a fast runner, slightly strange brag. But these women, however, were incredibly brave. They were with Jesus at his crucifixion. They were with him at his resurrection. N.T. Wright, a foremost theologian alive today, calls Mary Magdalene the apostle to the apostles. And the Orthodox tradition hails Mary as Isab Postolos, equal to the apostles. And so if qualification for apostle, for apostle is that you were, um, is a person who was with Jesus during his ministry, witnessed his resurrection and life, and then proclaimed it to others, which she did, she says, I have seen the Lord, then equal to the apostles she is. Claxon ready. The Bible does not permit women to teach or lead. 
no. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the first deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. I could read a similar passage in 1 Corinthians 14. My argument's going to be similar across the two. Okay, pastoral epistles, the letters that Paul writes to various people. He writes letters to particular individuals in particular circumstances. All of Paul's letters include some sort of general teaching, but usually there's a particular thing that he's addressing the um, the recipient of the letter for. So 1 Timothy chapter 2 relates to a specific issue within the Ephesian church. Now, if you don't read this verse out of context and you read the whole of 1 Timothy, it becomes blatantly clear from basically the third verse that this whole letter is about false teachers. And so we can assume that there was probably some wealthy, influential, or domineering women. Perhaps they weren't as educated as men who are looking to sort of take over the teaching within the church. They want to have authority um, in there. And so this, from Paul, is a corrective letter into a particular situation. Paul believes that this church has been infected with false teaching, and therefore there's infighting and gender-based underhand behavior. And he's writing to Timothy, he goes, hey, mate, sort it out. So two reasons why the text and one from without that this is a situational example and not a general prohibition for all time um, within the context of the church. One, Paul uses an extremely rare Greek word, authentio, instead of more common terms for authority. I kid you not, this is in here once. There's no cross-reference. You can't compare it to anything else in the scriptures. This suggests it's a specific situation rather than one with general application. Some translators say that this has to do with domineering. So it's plausible that Paul chose this word to discourage women from dominating men through teaching or by power. So notice, Paul does not reject women looking for equality. He rejects women looking to dominate men and take control. Two, the translation, I do not permit, it's misleading because the Greek verb here normally refers to something sort of limited in time, okay? It's not a permanent phrase. So it's more like Paul is saying, I am not permitting during this ongoing crisis or false teaching in Ephesus, rather than a universal prohibition. And here is my killer point. Finally, if 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12 is a permanent prohibition, it contradicts instances in the Bible where women are affirmed as teachers and leaders with authority. Whenever I hear anybody say, well, according to Paul, women can't, I just think, well, they did. So Priscilla, who is on the screen here, is named before her husband Aquila, which is perhaps unique in ancient writing. I can't be that, can't tell for sure, but it certainly bestows on her the primary authority in that relationship. In addition, as you see in the passage above, she is teaching and correcting Apollos, and he was a pretty big deal evangelist in the early church. Paul also commends Phoebe because he sent her with his letter to the Romans. She probably played a role as the letter carrier. Um, She would have been on hand to answer interpretive questions as the letter was read out. And some scholars believe that she was the one who would have read Romans to the church in Rome. Bottom line, she's really important. Yeah? She is a trusted colleague of Paul. She's not someone's wife. She's not an errand girl. She is mentioned without naming a male counterpart at all. Also quite interesting in ancient antiquity writing. He calls her a sister. This is not mundane Chriso language. Hey, sister in Christ. It's not that. It's, this is like when he says to Timothy, you're my brother. It's a title of honor. You are a fellow leader in the church. And so Paul calls Phoebe a deacon. And some translators will say, yeah, well, this is just, you know, it means servant. But actually, this word has definitely got a broad range of use in the scriptures, and it can involve leadership of a church. And so if she was not an official leader of the church in Senecri, I think I'm saying that right, Paul, he could have used a slightly different word. He could have used the verb diakonio for her service rather than the noun diakonos, which is what he calls her. There's no deaconesses. It's a deacon. Okay, And so in Paul's letter, he uses this particular word, deacon, for a variety of people. You'd be interested to know who they are, wouldn't you? Yeah. He uses the same word for Christ, and Apollos, and the apostles, and Paul himself, and Tychicus, and Epaphras. Men! Oh no. Oh no. It seems that Paul is doing the same thing as Kevin on salt. He's showing... That Adam was born first, and therefore he must be better. No! 
When Paul refers to key Old Testament stories, his intention is broader. The focus of this scriptural reference is not to establish some sort of inherent superiority of men based on firstborn privilege. In fact, Paul attributes the blame of what happens in Eden to Adam far more. He does it in Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 rather than Eve. Remember the context. Remember what Paul is writing to Timothy about. Paul is aiming to humble any arrogant Ephesian women who might be looking to cause trouble for men, falsely believing that they are wiser. Okay? Claxon ready. Wives must submit to their husband. No! But a little bit yes. Now... (laughs) The idea of headship comes in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, but also to Titus. So when Paul uses the word head, he's not using a word that sort of implies hierarchy or ruler. He's using a Greek word that means source. It conveys the idea of one who willingly sacrifices and lays down their own life. So just as Christ's body became a source of life for the church, as we've celebrated, as we've done communion, he dies, we receive forgiveness, Adam's body, a rib was taken from Adam and Eve was created. And so when Paul says that the husband is the head of the woman, he's emphasizing not hierarchy, not authority, but dependence and unity. That's what he's saying. And so these verses, they're located also in a larger passage of Scripture where Paul's talking about lots of different relationships between different people um, in the church. And there's this key verse that really sort of is like the key to unlocking all of these verses. And what he says is, it comes with his command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the overall argument of this section of Scripture is Paul is stating that the Holy Spirit enables Christians to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's chapter 5, verse 21. And so for Paul, submission, it's a characteristic of being a Christian. It's a characteristic of being the new humanity in Christ. It's not a feminine ideal for only half the church to do. So all of us, all Christians, are to submit to one another in love and in humility. And I have to say that that would have been an idea that would have been utterly radical for the first listeners. It would have absolutely changed everything. So, yeah, actually... Wives, you have to submit to your husbands. But husbands, you have to submit to your wives. This is a mutual submission. It is not weighted to one more than the other. That's enough claxoning. My understanding of Scripture is that the beginning and the ultimate trajectory of the Bible is equality and cooperation between man and woman. Now, as I laid out at the start, our present reality does not reflect the created order nor the recreated order that is to come. We are in this in-between time, and this job is ours to seek and to cooperate with God for heaven on earth, to bring a foretaste of what it will one day be like with no disunity, with peace, connection into our present. And I believe wholly that we, the church, we should be at the forefront of gender equality. I believe that we all, personally, corporately, need to reevaluate our beliefs, our attitudes and behaviours when it comes to gender and equality. And some of us in this room will have extraordinary influence um, to, to do that. And some of us, we need to take responsibility for ourselves and what's right in front of us. Now, for me... As one of the leaders in this church, my role is clear and it's unchanged. My role is to equip the saints for ministry. All the saints. Every single one. And um, it's not often that I get the opportunity to say this as clearly um, at the front, front of church. But I think on an occasion like this, I think it's worth doing. That I believe that women can should, must, lead in every sphere of the church if they feel that God has gifted them and called them to do so. And where you haven't heard that said in churches, I'm sorry, but in this one, you have now heard it. And I know um, for John, who's on holiday um, today, that I'm definitely speaking for John when I say that too. And when I say that, I don't say that, you know, 
for women in this room that you have to conform to a certain of idea of what women look like. You know, some women are just empathetic, gentle, kind, and others are bold and brash and, forgive me, ballsy leaders. <laughs> and that's okay, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, it's wonderful, isn't it, um, to have a gift of Kirstine and Andy on our team at this time. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Gifted and godly people who wish to serve God and serve God's people. Now, both these two, they have similarities, but they also are really quite different as well. Different gifts, different passions, different drives, as it should be. This should never be a one-size-fits-all church. You should not be sat in those chairs going, I have to, if I want to do anything, I have to aspire to be like Matt or Kirstine or Andy or John. That is not interesting. All of us, all of us, our role, our job is really, as Christians, to identify the things that we are gifted to do and to use them to serve others and build God's kingdom. It's a weirdly simple thing we have to do, and yet, gosh, haven't we got ourselves into a bit of a pickle doing it? There will be some people in this room right now listening to me speak, and you share the same vocation as Kirsteen, as Andy, and me, but you haven't been in spaces where people, women, have been there, and you could have seen yourself doing it. And I hope that you will have the confidence to out yourself and put yourself forward, and you should speak to myself or Andy or Kirsteen if that's you. But it's not really about Andy or Kirstein. It's not the main thing, um, as good as they are. For too long, women have been overlooked, they've been sidelined, silenced, and disempowered in the church, and it needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. Now, for all of you, you do not have to become a vicar to use your gifts. Not everybody is called to that, but every single one of us has to use our gifts. You have a voice it deserves to be said loud and proud. For the sake of the world, we need every single member of our community and every church across the world and the city to use our gifts, however big or small we think they may be, but to use them for God's glory and for his kingdom. So I just wonder, just before we um, sing another song and pray for people, I wonder, what, what's God gifted you to do? What are you gifted at? What are the things that you've not put yourself forward for? Perhaps that's exactly what God is speaking to you about now. Because my job, Kirstine's job, Andy's job, is to equip the saints for ministry. All the saints. And so we are looking to call out gifts that we see in other people and also nurture the gifts and the talents that are in you. Amazing to see Amalia leading worship, who 10 months ago probably wouldn't have been leading worship, but has been on this journey. Amazing. There are more stories like this. It doesn't have to be stuff on the stage. The stuff with our social supermarket, the, the difference we're making in our local community, our small groups, there are so many ways that we can make a difference. So we're going to pray um, in just a moment. But first, we're going to sing a song, and um, I invite Peter to the manager. Do you want to stand?